I'm Jennifer Dye, a librarian at Detroit Public Library. DPL has offered astronomy programs for the last several years. When things fell apart in spring 2020, programs were put on hiatus. We finally launched astronomy programs on Zoom early last year. Over the past several months, we've worked with Megan McCullen, director of the Wayne State University Planetarium on programs presented by Wayne State faculty and alumni. We're going to continue our past practice of presentations by members of local astronomy clubs, including Adrian, but look forward to working more with Megan and the planetarium. And I really appreciate Megan's help with running these programs. Next month's program will be a tour of the solar system presented by Bob Tremblay. And I'd like to ask Megan to speak briefly before I introduce tonight's speaker. I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> That's okay. Uh, thanks. I'm going to keep my video off because I forgot my charger. So we're on uh, borrowed time right now. But um, uh, thank you all for being here. We love participating in these events with the library as well. Um, they've been really great uh, collaborations. And as we were mentioning, the planetarium is going to try to do our first stargazing in a while on statewide astronomy night, April 8th. Uh, and there are many other events happening around uh, the state that night. So if you Google Swan, Michigan, you should be able to start finding um, events that are coming up. I'll try to see if there's a link as well I can put in the chat. Uh, and we're also going to have the next one of our planetarium uh, alumni association talks, which we call our Journeys with Jerry, uh, where one of our emeritus professors takes us to uh, different places that he's uh, been, telescopes that he's visited around the world, uh, things like that. And I believe the next one is going to be about um, the light sail program and a cruise he got to go on that was related to promoting uh, light sail. And uh, that should be pretty interesting. So uh, we believe it's going to be April 21st, but I'm waiting on a confirmation for that too. So stay tuned. We've got more events to share with you as well. And we'd uh, love to see you there. So thank you, Jennifer. If people have questions during the talk, I'll be the one monitoring the chat. Um, feel free to direct message me as well if you have any issues, um, and I will try to help out. Okay, thank you, Megan. Adrian Bradley is actively involved in several astronomy clubs, as he mentioned, and he seems to get roped into officer roles. He frequently travels with camera in hand to photograph the night sky. And tonight he will share some of his photos and some of the wonder. Adrian. All right, thank you for the introduction. Short and sweet, my name is Adrian Bradley and um, I am going to jump right into sharing my presentation. Um, let me get it started. And as everyone has said, if there are any questions about any of the um, any of the slides or the slideshow with that I put to music that I'll have at the um, you know last ten minutes of my presentation, um, any questions, just let me know. Um, and I am going to admit someone else. All right, no, uh, don't worry about that, Adrian. I'll okay, take I'll let you. Okay, yeah. I, Thank so, you. So on the slide, you notice Rask Astro Imager, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Um, you don't have your slides up yet, Adrian. I don't. Not I thought right. I shared. Oh, you know what? I don't think I finished starting to share. Okay, there Thank we go. You. Right. Now we're starting to share. That's good. Um, One from this height. I need to hide that. All right, so, so you heard the introduction. I'm in several astronomy clubs. Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is one that I joined recently. Um, my hopes are to travel to Canada and do some night sky imaging up there. The Warren Astronomical Society is the group that you're familiar with. Bob Trimbley is a fellow VP. Um, well, I'm the treasurer of the Warren Astronomical Society. And Bob Trimbley is the one that recommended that I come in and do the presentation. Over in Ann Arbor, my first group was University Lowbrow Astronomers. Tonight, I told them I would not be presenting at the Explore Scientific Global Star Party. This star party, similar to something like this, where it, you know, people from all over the world will join in and look at presentations from both 
um, professional and uh, amateur astronomers such as myself. And I'm, I've been invited back um, quite a few times. So very, uh, very happy to be a part of that. So let's start out with a quick definition of what is a nightscape. And um, these terms are here to help you kind of get an idea. You've got astronomy. This is all of us, stargazer. And it's in the dictionary. Astrology, when the sign, you know, the constellation is in the signs, you know, have some sort of, you know, have some sort of meaning on life, astronomer, um, studying astronomical objects that are not on Earth. A new terms emerge, landscape astrophotographer. So I put this up to sort of set the foundation of the sort of stuff that I like to do is present the night sky, but I found that I like including Earth in the night sky. Um, when you shoot just at the night sky itself, you've got events happening like the comet, or you're shooting at a part of the Milky Way and you get this nebula. Lunar eclipse, you, um, you can shoot a wide angle view and the lunar eclipse is just hanging out there and you can see other, you can see other stars in the night sky. You can see nebulae that may look like something that you, that looks familiar to you. This may look like a baby. This might look like a heart or maybe a bow and arrow. And then these two are clusters that are actually headed towards earth, but they're millions of miles away. And the Orion Nebula here. So out of classic astrophotography, this gentleman right here, Dr. David Levy, um, I think this is a gentleman from the Vatican Observatory and we're from, this was a few years ago, 2017, we met and Dr. Levy showed a simple image he made in the Southern Hemisphere, that's the Southern Cross. And something about seeing stars in the sky from a camera said, I didn't know you could do that. And I wanna learn how to do that. So that's really where my journey started was seeing such a simple image taken in 2017. And I suddenly wanted to do nightscapes, but I also do nature targets and things like understanding your target. I put this slide in here because one of the things that I wanted to capture was this Caspian Tern getting close to the water. And it took six months. This is one of the shots. I thought it was pretty good. And then I took another one where it was closer. The same thing happens with nightscapes. You take an image and then you say, you know, I could do a little bit better. Um, so you take another one you may learn from that. And then one night you take an image that you really like and, and then you, away you go. So here's first nightscape that I'm showing everyone, clouds. One of the things that hampers, those of you that are interested in astronomy know that when it's cloudy, it can hamper your view of things in the night sky but nightscapes or landscape astrophotography as it's called, um, uh, shots at night can still be done with clouds and you can produce an interesting image by just using, using what's been handed to you. And in this case, in Port Sanilac, I had clouds. However, not long after that, the clouds dissipated and I got a clear shot. There is the winter Milky Way next to Orion. Now uh, you're seeing some red in here that you normally wouldn't see with your eyes. I use a special camera to get that information. Also, if you look down here, you're seeing these streaks. These are real. They're called light pillars. And because it was cold that night and there's ice crystals in the clouds here, the light pillars show up. Man-made lighting that gets refracted basically up into the sky in the form of a column or a pillar. Uh, they seemed rare because you only see them in certain conditions, but 
in Michigan in the winter, those conditions happen more often than not. So there are, there are several pictures of those light pillars that are out. And um, I've had, I've had a couple of them that got reprinted online. So starting out in my journey to do night photography, these are images taken with a 12 or now maybe now 14 year old camera and it's 14 year old kit lens. And I just use some settings to long exposure to try and capture what I could of the night sky ended up with this serene picture of Earth shine on the moon and its setting, this Milky Way over here. Um, using that camera, and oh, by the way, this is Saturn. Using that camera, I um, just basically learned how to capture stars and how to capture, you know, if it's brighter, how to capture moon, how to ca capture the moon and how to set it up with whatever foreground on earth now nowadays i can brighten this area but i was still happy with the image at the time as soon as you learn how to do that and then you're able to move to a camera with a larger sensor which is that modified 6d so modification just think of it as i had the camera modified so that this reddish light would come in. Um, notice how much more of the Milky Way we're seeing and notice that I do have the trees in the foreground um, where you can actually see the tree detail in the foreground. So that came, this is, I'd say five years, this is a five years of um, doing this. And now we have this image where very similar, but you know, once you um, let's see, clicking on this. Nope, that's gonna go. Once you learn your process, then you worry about your gear. You worry about um, you know, you worry about getting gear that'll help you present the type of image you want to see a lot better. And this is what I use now. So those of you that know your cameras. You may not know what this move shoot move tracker is. Well, it's a um, it's a small tracker where you can mount onto a tripod, you can mount your camera, and it'll follow the rotation of the Earth, which means it's following the night sky. So now you can take longer exposures with your camera equipment and get a a clearer night sky. It does have a trick where you can move it slower and you end up getting a single shot of your foreground, your foreground won't be blurry, but your night sky won't be blurry either. So it's kind of a best of both worlds. So I always recommend you can start with basic gear, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, you can still get pretty good photos, but um, you the gear goes up you know, as you go. So um, starting with basic stuff, those of you that learned camera, learned to shoot um, any kind of camera, especially in the digital, the digital cameras, wouldn't be comfortable setting your ISOs to here. All this means, you know, in terms of getting a photo at night, there's very little light to work with. So your camera has to be able to bring in light a lot faster than it would normally during the day. Your shutter speeds, if you're using a wide angle lens like these between 14 to 24 millimeter, you're gonna go 10 to 20 seconds if you don't have a tracker and you're still gonna get a shot that looks like this. And that's the other thing I didn't put here, go someplace where it's really dark. The place I'm showing you is, uh, the rescue house at Point O'Bark Lighthouse Park. I've got plenty more shots of other areas of this park. Um, it is a, it's a nice dark area that I'll travel to in the thumb of Michigan. And let's see, next slide, if it'll, okay, there we go. With a tracking mount, this is where the term astrophotography comes in. Astrophotography, astrophotographers, 
um, tend to take long exposures, repeated long exposures, and they use computer software to stack those. It's like stacking exposures on top of each other to end up with the cleanest signal. And it, it increases the amount of time, total amount of time of an exposure. And you end up with more detail in whatever it is that you're shooting. A lot of landscape astrophotographers will do this to create these fantastically bright Milky Way, Milky Ways over some sort of, you know, really interesting foreground like Stonehenge or, you know, some it'll and it'll end up looking like a painting of sorts. Um, so doing a composite image. A lot of times I like to go out and I just like to take a single image and I like that single image to have everything that I want to see. So um, I'll show you a couple of the type of images that I prefer taking. Here they are. Dark, the darker the skies, the less difference. So here are some cameras. And again, those of you that are familiar with camera gear may recognize what some of these mean. If there are questions about it, you can type those in the chat if you have questions about what some of these mean. But if you look at the two pictures, the one that lets in more red light is showing all the red light that's in and around this camp with this Milky Way and it shows more red light within the Milky Way itself. Notice what you've got. You've got a stock camera. It's not a special one. It's not modified for space. But when you go where it's really dark, this was out in Kenton, Oklahoma, 50 miles from any kind of civilization. And um, the sky is dark enough to where you're, you know, there isn't too much difference between what you get with these images. So that's, you know, in the, in the skies in the city of Detroit, it can, you know, you, you aren't going to see anything like this because it's just not dark enough. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's the amount of light that you're around affects what you can see and what you can, what your camera can see in the night sky, because if there's too much light, your camera will pull that light in and it'll wash everything out. So for those of you that haven't seen the Milky Way or you've heard about it, what is it? This is the part of the Milky Way that most folks, um, when you're talking about it, you're talking about this brightest part that you see in those two images. So now we'll show some places that I've traveled to take images. And this image is true to what you would see with your eyes at a a typical dark sky park in Michigan. There are three that I can think of. This one is Lake Hudson Dark Sky Recreation Area. It's about an hour and a half, maybe close to two hours from Detroit. Um, it's about 30 minutes from Toledo, Ohio. Um, this is not a meteor here. This is a plane that I captured when I did this image. Um, those of you that are out there, if this were interactive, I'd ask you, who knows what the Big Dipper looks like? Who knows what the Little Dipper looks like? And after you raised your hands, I would say, can you find it in this image? Some of you may have found them. But for the rest of us, because when I looked at this image again, I couldn't find it. I just traced out for you the Big Dipper, and now I'm tracing out the Little Dipper. And there's the North Star. There are the pointer stars, Mirac and Doobie. And uh, they point to the North Star. So that at a dark sky park, the typical stars that you see get mixed in with all these other secondary stars that you can suddenly see. So this is, this is true to what you would see with your eyes if you were there with me looking at this part of the sky while I was taking a picture. The glow down here is from a town that's not far, not too far away to the north. Um, I think Hudson is to the north. And so sometimes we don't get a good image, so we can't show anything in our slideshows. 
the images were blurry. I had the old 30D. I'm looking at the back of my camera and thinking, I got all these great images. It's nice and dark. And I get home and they look like donuts. All the stars and I look in them, they look like they have holes in them. Everything's blurry. Nothing came out the way I wanted it to. All I learned is as I'm taking shots, I should make sure everything's in focus. Look at the back of the camera once. If everything's in focus, nothing's going to move, then, then start taking images. And I actually mark my lenses that I use for night photography. I mark the focal point so I can turn it right to there, take a test shot, make sure everything is sharp, and, um, and then I go from there. I had a chance to go to San Francisco in 2019. And so you have this Golden Gate Bridge picture. If I were to zoom it in, you'd see a couple of stars. San Francisco's bright, even though there was fog over here, the Golden Gate happened to not be covered with fog. So I was able to get some, this and many other shots of it. And I went on the Golden Gate Bridge, I attempted to get starlight. And yes, it looks, you know, you know, these stars are, look more like tadpoles, but it's actual starlight on this part of the bridge. So as long, which gives me hope for um, Belle Isle. Going out to Belle Isle, we should be able to get a night sky picture. Even if the stars, if it isn't as bright as some of the images I've shown you, you should still be able to get starlight even at Belle Isle because out here in San Francisco on the bridge where it's reasonable, it was reasonably dark on the bridge. There were some light there. You could see the lights that were on the bridge. And um, I was still able to get starlight with my camera. So it's just about the technique that you use to get starlight. And the gear helps a full frame sensor and a camera pulls in more light, but long exposures, and you try and keep the camera still. I didn't have a tripod, so I just had to set the camera down. And the bridge shakes, so that created the, uh, the streaking that you see here. So here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we're near a bright town. So the night sky, you know, it's hard to get any kind of Milky Way, but it's just dark enough, as you can see in this photo, to get a... Um, a Milky Way photo. There are more stars here. It's, it's a rural area a few miles outside of the city of Ann Arbor. So rural areas are places where you begin to see a lot of stars, but there are places even darker than that. If you go, we were chatting with someone, um, we were chatting with someone about Auburn, Michigan, which is two hours north. Um, Alcona County, and this is the Ossible River right here. This is um, the Alcona Pond. There are those light pillars. When it's dark, even clouds don't stop the starlight from coming in. And um, I can't help but see the question. How long of an exposure did that take on the bridge? It was a 15 second exposure. So I'm answering that one right away. Here, these exposures are around 30 seconds and with the ISO turned up and even through clouds, light pillars, you can get some amazing images when it's a darker area. The moon is coming up here and you're seeing, um, you're still seeing some of the Milky Way and you're still seeing the stars of Orion and all the other stars when it's dark enough, the stars don't fade as fast as they do when you're in a place that's got a lot of lighting to it. So you'll see more images of this, these place, well, this place especially. In the thumb, you, you're facing Lake Huron. So it gets dark enough. Now, if the moon is out, you can just take pictures using the moon, but when you, when it's dark enough and the moon's not in the sky, the stars are all out. You'll see more examples of, examples of those later. In the Upper Peninsula, if you take a look at this, this was a minute long exposure. 
you take a look at this Milky Way, you can see a lot of this detail with your own eyes when you're in a certain part of the UP. 45 minutes after crossing the bridge, you can start seeing more stars than you've seen more, more, more than likely, unless, you, unless you've traveled and, um, and you know the night sky. Um, you'll notice you'll notice a lot more stars when you go to the Upper Peninsula. Of course, it gets cloudy there. Tequamanan Falls State Park is a good place to stargaze. It does get dark, and I still owe Tequamanan Falls a proper picture. I took this picture, and I got there too late to take a uh, picture because the sun started to rise when I got there. But the UP is the absolute best. But what's better than the UP of Michigan? The southwest of the United States. Anywhere where there is what's called a portal one sky. The astronomical twilight, basically light from the sun, hasn't gone away yet. And the Milky Way is still this bright. It's, it's pretty amazing to see. And it's even more amazing to see when clouds come in. The underside of the clouds are dark. The Milky Way shines the way that we see the full moon shining through clouds. The Milky Way, the center of our galaxy, the, the, all the glowing stars are bright enough to shine through clouds. It's If you can travel to a place like the Southwest and see the night sky there, it'll, it'll spoil you when you get back home and you look up and realize you can't see any of what you're able to see here. So that is it for the talking part of the presentation. I'm going to play this. Um, basically, it's 10 minutes, and it's me sharing images that I've taken um, throughout my um, journey in the uh, in throughout my journeys, taking photos both day and night. Um, there's pictures of the moon here and just a, a number of different images. And I set them to music. There's basically three acts. There's the, there'd be the um, first with some piano music, the second with a little more upbeat and the third even more upbeat than that. And hopefully you all enjoy um, the presentation. And then afterwards, it'll be, um, it'll be time for questions and answers. So enjoy the presentation and we'll talk to you again soon.
All right, and that is the end of my presentation. So now we can open the floor for questions or comments. Thank you, Adrian. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we only have a few questions that have come in. So why don't I pull this up here? Uh, well, it wasn't a question so much. Megan asked how long of an exposure on the bridge. And uh, then she posted a list of uh, statewide astronomy events. I will post that again on, in the chat. But um, if anyone does want to ask a question, uh, I think if you raise your hand under reactions, I should be able to unmute you. Does anyone have a question? This is Megan. I just want to say those were great. This was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have more comments to that effect. No questions? You don't want to learn how you can do this in your spare time? I can did I talk. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and I apologize if you mentioned this while I was switching out computers and things like that. Um, uh, how long have you been doing astrophotography and how did you, and do you do other nature photography or do you strictly focus on connecting it up to astrophotography? So it's been roughly I don't know, seven years with the camera doing astrophotography in general, just because I had a, um, I had a little camera that goes into the eyepiece of a telescope. I had started out as a visual astronomer you know, maybe eight years ago, and then just kind of did a crash course in learning the night sky from visual astronomers, and um, then learning how to capture what I was seeing in the night sky with a camera. So it's been, it's been five years, like the first few pictures I took, um, it's been five years since, um, and I'm still learning every day. Um, just got, got to a point where my process got better for what I, what it is I wanted to show and um, you know, started to see more of, you know, what was behind what I was looking at. So, so yeah, it's been, I'd say it's been five years of just solid, you know, going out to sites and figuring, figuring out how to, you know, how to figure out what to do with the camera um, and, you know, where to, how to get it working. So, so yeah, that's that's basically it. Five five years, and hopefully many more. Learn even more things. Um, but but you were already a photographer. I was already a photographer. I remember nature photography, so birds, some landscapes, and lately I've been doing um, events and you know, and people. Not so much a fashion photographer. That's that's a realm that just looks like it takes it just takes having a certain ability to do the fashion, you know, your pulse on the fashion world, but shooting events, a little bit of architecture. Um, I've done some photography for hire. So I do like, I, I definitely like birding and capturing birds in flight. It's a, it's a fun thing for me to do as well. And I've got a few images that I've had the fortune of selling. Um, both the birding images and some of the night sky images. Adrian, we do have a question here. I'm going to allow this person to unmute. Or maybe, maybe I have to do something else here. Yeah, I see one in the chat. Do I take my camera mm -hmm. everywhere? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, I don't, if I'm going to the store and I know I'm not going out to shoot night photography, I won't take that special camera. But um, if I, I usually have one. I'm, oh, say it again. Why, Andrew Pfeffer, you had a question? over. I'm sorry about that. I talked over you. Uh, say your question again, Wyatt, yeah. or comment. I don't have a question. Okay. What's your comment? 
I don't have a comment either. All right, your hand was raised. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have a question? I'll ask another one. Um, <laughs> uh, do you have any uh, specific places you're looking forward to uh, trying to take photography at besides Belle Isle now? But like, is there another place that's on your bucket list you want to get to? There are a couple, um, and they're pretty. They're pretty grand. Well, one isn't so grand. It's further up in the UP. I want to go back to Taquamanan Falls and get a few more images there. I want to go all the way to uh, Whitefish. Uh, I think it's Whitefish Point on the edge where you can see Lake Superior to the north and get some images there. Other places in the UP. And um, I have been invited down to Argentina if I can cobble together the funds and fly down to Argent Chivalcoy, Argentina and see some Southern Hemisphere skies. That is, uh, that is on the bucket list. Uh, Canada, places in Canada are on the list. And um, I don't know so much about Iceland. That's, that's a place that a lot of photographers go to do general landscape, but for nightscape, I, you know, I wanna go to just places that are dark. New Zealand and Australia, are also on the list. We have a question in the chat. Um, how safe is it to go out in the cold with your camera? It's safe, I've tested it. Um, I've taken shots at zero degrees. One of the light pillar shots you saw, um, in fact, maybe both of them, it was zero outside, as in zero Fahrenheit. Um, and the camera did just fine. So you can take it out in the cold. Cameras actually work really well in the cold. At astronomy dedicated cameras are cooled to um, zero Celsius is like maybe a few, like 20 or so degrees Fahrenheit, you know, below, you know, below freezing. Cameras do well. Um, I think you'd have to be, you know, you'd have to be frigid before a camera might might have trouble working so as in do you have to be careful about condensation about um temperature changing temperature changes are when you're in that kind of that fall area you do um if you hit a dew point any any kind of weather where you hit a dew point while you're out you're going to have that problem and you can you can get heaters for your camera to fight the dew point issue, but um, you do you do have that. Or if you've got your uh, hoods for your lens hoods, lens hoods actually act as dew shields. So you you get a little bit of time um, where your lens will stay clear even though you're close to a dew point. So that does yeah having a heater a heat a small little element to heat the lens or keep the lens heated so that it doesn't reach the dew point there are some fellow astrophotographers and uh, landscape astrophotographers that do that right um we have a question of is that amazing video posted anywhere so that we can share it with friends not yet I um, I do have a link to a shorter version, and I want to put that longer version out there. I have a I have a link where online where you could download it and share it. Um, I have to see how many more presentations I'm giving with it, and then and then let it go out into the wild. Um, so pretty soon. Um, there, I do have a, I have a web, website, which is basically a gallery, and that's where I may end up sharing it. Well, it will be shared as part of this recording. <laughs> yeah, it's, so that's, that's the other thing. You can, you can see it as a part of the recording. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I will, I'll share the link to the slideshow. Um, what I'll do is I'll email it to you, Jennifer, That's once fine. I've uploaded this. This was the first time presenting this version of that slideshow. The uh, the version that I have out there ended before the moonshots. 
-hmm. those were the, the the seven minute version and i recently extended it to include a few other shots so so you all are first to see the 10 minute version of that um of that slideshow adrian i see your i googled you um so i see your uh link at myportfolio.com do you mind if i put it in the chat not at all okay And we have one question about capturing the northern lights from northern Michigan. Um, Paul moved out of Alaska three months ago. So I think he's been well, the northern lights. So if you saw the presentation at Point O'Bark Lighthouse Park, that's in the thumb. That's actually as far south in Michigan as you can still capture the northern lights. And th th those were the northern lights up there. Um, one of the images had basically a kind of a smattering of the northern lights in Alcona County. But uh, northern Michigan, you can definitely catch northern lights. They're more on the horizon. If you've been to Alaska, um, where the northern lights can go overhead, it would have to be a large event, a larger event for the northern lights to go overhead. And those of you that may remember seeing the northern lights from as far south as Detroit, that was one of those events, um, but you, we haven't had one. We might end up getting one. The sun has been pretty active lately. So we may have one of those events in store, um, but Northern Michigan, you don't even have to go to the upper peninsula. You can, you can go into the thumb of Michigan and then go to the tip of the thumb facing North. That lighthouse that you know, I showed, Point O'Bark Lighthouse is, how it's pronounced and it's a great place to see the northern lights because it's a clear view across Lake Huron um, but then you can go to you can go up to the upper peninsula true northern Michigan Lake Superior and should see them just fine any other questions Well, if you want to uh, be notified of future events, uh, you can email me. Um, for some reason, this is doing something weird here. We try to have the astronomy programs every fourth Thursday. We change when there's a conflict for some reason. The next scheduled program is a tour, uh, is a tour of the solar system by Bob Tremblay, whom Adrian and I both know. Struggling well. Here we go. And that's the Eventbrite link. And I will double check that I have the correct date on this. Apparently, there was a problem with the dates on Eventbrite, which is why so few people who'd registered showed up. Well, I'm happy for those that were able to come in and those that were in a little late. Um, like I said, there were it's recorded so you can always come in or go back to the beginning and see the talking part of the presentation or just wait on the um the images the images slideshow which i'm going to upload and send the email out um don't know how long it'll take to upload it but i'm going to uh i'm actually going to go ahead and get that started as we uh come to the end of the uh, presentation here. That way I don't forget. Yes, I have to do things like that too. Make sure that I do them before I forget. Well, thank you everyone for coming. And thank you so much, Adrian. Those are beautiful images. Yes, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see people later. Uh, all right, one last call for questions. And Megan mentioned all, earlier uh, that uh, we're going to have uh, um, a program on Belle Isle on May 8th, was it? April 8th. And oh, I checked, sorry. Um, it's not on the Belle Isle Nature Center website yet, so I don't know if they've finalized the times that we're going to be there because we have to make sure they're available 
and when we need to be off off the island away from the nature center. So uh, hopefully we'll know soon. I did check Adrian the um, the moon is up that night. It sets at two thirty a.m. So it's uh, like a first quarter moon. Um, uh, so we quarter. should be yep. good for the moon. They usually try to plan statewide astronomy night for a good quarter moon um, early on. Okay. So that yeah, I stand corrected. I it. We still I know might it have rises. clouds. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it rises. Michigan. Yeah, yeah. It's Michigan. You know what it is? I looked at it and it's a new moon that's a week away so you're right it's a it's a first quarter moon i'm looking at that and thinking it was a full moon but no i'll be i'll be out trying to image the week before because it's a new moon so no you're right the moon will be up so yeah so my apologies there that's, that's okay that's correct it, I, it made me I have another, myself yeah i have another question here so i'm going to allow lydia to unmute Lydia, can you get? Can you ask your question? This is Phil, Lydia's husband. Hello. Uh, I, I apologize. <laughs> Hello, we really enjoyed that, Adrian. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my son Titus wanted to know what that picture behind you is on your screen. That is the Milky Way photo that I took from the uh, Upper Peninsula on Highway 123, heading towards uh, Paradise, Michigan. And I'll jump out of the way. It was in the slideshow. There's my chair blocking everything. That is it. That is. Thank you. Un you're welcome. Until I went to um, Texas to see the, the um, night sky there, it had been the deepest image the most detailed image of the Milky Way that I had taken to that point. And uh, once I went to Texas, I was able to get a similar image like that in half the time. Wow, thank you so much. Welcome. All right, Wyatt has a question again. So I am going to, oh, he still can unmute himself. And there, Wyatt. Did you have something you want to You guys to are awesome. Thank you. Thank That's you. I'm really glad you were able to come. Thank you so much, Adrian. It was great. Welcome. To My name is Wyatt, not Adrian. Adrian's the person who presented. I was going to make a comment for <laughs> the... Um, show that the um, Explorer Scientific Global Star Party, they're young folks just like uh, Wyatt um, who are presenting astronomy materials. The, uh, the love of astronomy has gotten to the point where you've got anywhere from eight year olds, 11 year olds on up to teenagers and college age uh, kids who are discovering astronomy and doing their own their own um, presentations uh, about astronomy and about what they're learning. So this amateur astronomy is truly an all ages pursuit and it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, it, it's now that the cliche is that the sky's the limit, but really it's beyond the sky becomes the limit. Um, and astronomy is, uh, it's picking up some steam as far as interest among uh, especially younger folks. I picked it up late in life and um, wish I had started a lot earlier. Okay. I think we're done. I don't think we have more questions. Thank you again, Adrian. Thank you, Megan, for your help. Thank you both. This was great. Glad to be a part of it. All right. I will let people know. Well, I, it will be on the... Uh, library's YouTube page um, at uh, some point in the next few days. Um, let's see. Unfortunately, uh, there's a lot on the uh, YouTube site, so it's kind of hard to find the astronomy things. I'm asking for a sub channel for astronomy. Thank you. Yep.
I have yes. the link to that presentation for those that stayed. And I just posted it to the chat. You're so that fast. is <laughs> yeah, I up, it, it uploaded and I was somehow able to talk while I was uploading. So right now my bandwidth speeds are better than expected. So that full presentation is now uploaded and at the link that I shared and uh, feel free to to share it and um, enjoy. That's great, thank you. Yep, and hopefully we'll, I'll come back and do another presentation. I would like to have you come back um, and see people at Belle Isle. Yep, look, I put it in the calendar. I'll, um, <laughs> I'll see if I can avoid, uh, I'm an avid bowler, so I'll see if I can avoid being invited to bowl somewhere and tell them I got other stuff to do. And uh, well, I'll look forward to seeing you all in person. Well, maybe I'll see you at a WASP meeting again. That too. I've been getting to meetings for a while. Yeah, well, uh, we're working on, we're working on getting those in person. So you yes. all will be able to come. And I think we do have the open house scheduled to be an in-person open house, so. So they're working on it. All right. I will try to keep people informed of events. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. You all, this is a, uh, I like the format and look forward to coming back. And I will talk Great. with you all later. Bye. Thanks, Jen, for putting this together. You're welcome.